Good evening. This is Heartstock Radio, and I'm your host, Carol Murphy. Thank you so much for listening. Remember that you can find us on Facebook, or you can also contact us at heartstockradio at gmail.com. This week, our guest is Tiffany Rose Naputi Laxado. And in just a moment, Tiffany will be back and tell you all about her company, Lay Company Cooperative. This is Heartstock. And I'm Carol Murphy. Thank you so much for listening. We'll be right back. This is Heartstock Radio. Thanks so much for listening. Our guest this evening is Tiffany Rose Naputi Laxado. Hi, Tiffany. Hi. <laughs> Thank you so much for being on Heartstock. Can you just give our listeners a brief introduction about your company and what it is that you do? Okay. So, hello, listeners. My name is Tiffany Rose Napati Laxado, and I am the CEO and founder of the Lay Company Cooperative, Inc. And the Lay Company Cooperative, Inc. is a floral design company that specializes in lays. So, we make and we sell lays, and we do it in an environmentally conscious and also labor-conscious way. Uh, we hire Pacific Islander women to make and sell the lathes. Yeah, and uh, our aim, we have several aims, um, but one of our aims is to return the economic benefit of lathes to the community um, that it's appropriated from. Excellent. And I, I believe you employ men because if I remember right, at one of your events, there was a, a ukulele player that was a blind gentleman that was also employed by the lake company. Is that right? Yes. Yes. So it's men. That, it, yes, you're absolutely right. Thank you for reminding me. Um, <laughs> it is, we do employ men and women. And actually some of our first laymakers were men. Traditionally, is this the case? Are men and women involved in making lays in your culture? I would say so. Our company focuses on lays here on the continental U.S. And so a variety of people make lays, men, women, um, different generations, and even people who aren't Pacific Islanders also make lays. Excellent. So can you tell our listeners a little bit about where you grew up and where you're at currently? You know, what brought you to this venture in your life? Oh, okay. Uh, let's see. So I was born on the island of Guam. Um, and then my family moved from Guam to Hawaii uh, to up and down the West Coast. And then we landed in Oakland, California by the time I was 10. So I grew up in Oakland. At the time, it was a really working class town. It was um, the neighborhoods I lived in were primarily African American. Um, and then through the years, it started diversifying. Um, originally, my background is in public health, and I worked in um, HIV and AIDS and in like HIV AIDS and STD prevention for LGBTQ youth. And then I also, later on in my life, I then worked in lactation and I worked with the Marin County women, infants, and children. I think that during my time in public health, um, I was able to serve people from the cradle to the grave. And what I found that regardless of, you know, who people were, like whether or not it was a Latina mom struggling with breastfeeding or an African-American gay young man 
um, who is high risk for HIV and AIDS. What I learned through that whole process is that their biggest barriers to health were always economic. And so when I started looking at my own life and wanting to, you know, make a greater impact in the world, my first thought was like, okay, I want to be a job creator. I didn't exactly know, like, how to do that. So I did what, like, you know, I did a logical thing. I was like, okay, I'll go and I'll get an MBA. And I enrolled in an MBA program. And then kind of alongside with that, I had always been, for many years, been working in the Pacific Islander community. You know, the Pacific Islander community is Melanesian, Micronesians, and Polynesians. And I knew that whatever venture I was going to go to, I wanted that work to not be on the periphery of what I was doing, but I wanted it to be in the center of what I was doing. And so that's kind of how the way company started. I was I was looking for something where I could provide jobs, good jobs. And I also wanted to bring all the work that I was doing with Pacific Islands into the center of what I was doing. And what was born out of that was the Lay Company. And what brought your family to Oakland originally? And why did originally, you leave mom? So, yeah. So, so my mother is Chamorro, and Chamorros are the indigenous people of the Mariana Islands, and my father is Filipino. And my father came to Guam because he had worked for an American construction company. And then when that contract ended, he then got a job working for CNH Sugar in Hawaii. Um, and he was part of the team in like the late 70s and the 80s that were closing down sugarcane plantations. And then eventually, I don't exactly, I know he worked for them twice. So then from there, then he got another job building, I think it was like a water park in Washington State, um, up in the Seattle Tacoma area. And then that's how we left Hawaii and we went to Washington State. And then in Washington State, that's when my mother died. And so I don't know what brought him to California, <laughs> but after my mother died, we found ourselves in California and we lived in many different places. So I think originally when we first got to California, we lived at Fort Ord with my uncle who was in the military. And then from there, we moved on to Southern California to like LA, Long Beach. And then by the time I was 10, we landed in Oakland. How old were you when your mother passed away? I was three. Wow. And did she or your aunties from your mother's side impress upon you their culture? Well, I would young. say, yeah, my mother died when I was really young, so I don't really have that much of a memory. I think that it is the absence of that mm. that has always made me want to connect to my culture. Because my father is Filipino, and he... I mean, he is, you know, what we call like fresh off the boat, right? He's an immigrant <laughs> to the United States. And so the experience that I had, however, for whatever reason, you know, when we landed in Oakland, my father knew that it was really important for me to be connected to our culture. Um, because in his eyes, he has always said, like, the children belong to the mother. And he made us go to a Samoan church. So I grew up actually in a Samoan church. Hmm. And that is where I actually learned how to make lace. So yeah, so that's kind of how we ended up in Oakland. And my father, he was also an entrepreneur. You know, he was a self-made like engineer. My father uh, had a, a car shop and he did like auto body. He did pretty much anything that had to do with a car. <laughs> so I also grew up, you know, as a young person working in a car shop you know, helping my dad with estimates. Mm. So that kind of business-minded entrepreneurial spirit has always kind of been a part of my family, especially my dad's side of the family. And yeah, that's how we ended up here in Oakland. And how did attaining an MBA contribute to this whole enterprise that you're 
involved with. Um, where did you get your MBA? And is that when you first decided you were going to found Ballet Company? Yes, actually. So, you know, I couldn't just get a regular MBA. <laughs> so, you know, my MBA program was actually something called an integral MBA in creative enterprises. And the school that I went to is Meridian University, and it's a international university that is based in Sonoma County. And it was just a school that that was very values aligned. It was a school that really wanted to help business practitioners figure out how do you move beyond sustainability? And so a lot of what we studied was, you know, business models, marketing, you know, financial management, leadership, um, you know, executive leadership that really was about how do we move past sustainability and become more regenerative to people, to the planet, to our spirit, to, you know, all sentient beings, to the universe at large. And how do we be able to, you know, align all those values while also making sure that you have enough resources and profit to be able to support all of those, those endeavors and all of those things. Is that when you first got the idea for the lay company, when you were getting your MBA? Yes. So I, let's see, how did that actually work out? So I actually was really interested just in general in terms of cultural practitioners and masters. You know, I was interested really in cultural preservation and, you know, what what did that look like? And what I found when I did some initial research was that there weren't very many people who were considered masters here, you know, like masters of any of the different crafts. And even though I think in my opinion they were masters, I think in their own opinions they, they were masters. And so when I started doing um, my research, you know, what I realized is that, like, a lot of the folks that, you know, I thought were masters in their craft, you know, they were great and they were all these really talented artists, and yet most of them had lived in poverty. And so I was trying to figure out, like, okay, well, how can we, how can we help these, you know, masters? You know, I thought I was going to, like, um, at the end of my MBA, like start an incubator program for our cultural practitioners, you know, so that they could figure out ways how to financially, you know, sustain and regenerate themselves. And then what ended up happening was that, you know, I came across laymaking. Like I, I, I ended up interviewing laymakers and, you know, our folks were pretty much giving lays away for almost free. And I was like, wait a minute, but there's this huge market for lays. And when, you know, just on, in the anecdotal kind of research that I was doing, it seemed that most of the people who were selling lay were actually Pacific Islanders. And it just, you know, you kind of just like go down the rabbit hole and you uncover more and more and more and more data. And I the the culmination of that data was like, we've got to figure out a way to return the economic benefits of lay to the people whose culture is, is appropriated from here in the continental United States. That's beautiful. And so that's, can, well, yeah, can that's what the lay, the lay company is. Yeah. We're at that halfway point. We're going to take a quick music break. In just a moment, we will be back with Tiffany, and she's going to tell us more about the Lay Company Cooperative. This is Heartstock, and I'm your host, Carol Murphy. Thank you so much for listening. We'll be right back.
Heartstock Radio, and I'm Carol Murphy, your host. This evening, our guest is the founder and the director of the Lay Company Cooperative based in Oakland, California. Hi, Tiffany. Thanks so much for being on Heartstock. Hi. <laughs> We were just talking about you getting your MBA, and and it seemed like that was when the whole idea came to fruition about starting the Lay Company. Can you tell our listeners just a little bit more about the vision and, and the mission of your company? Okay. Yeah, so I think one of the things I, I should actually add to why we started the Lay Company and to add, you know, why we talk about returning the economic benefit of lay to the people whose culture it's appropriated from is because so during my research and my, in, you know, in, in the MBA program, I learned that during the recession that the Pacific Islander community from like 2007 to 2011, um, the, the poverty rates increased 60%. And that was a huge, I mean, for any community, that's like really huge. But the, like when you compare it to the national average, it was like 27% of people fell into poverty during the recession. But for our community, that was 60% increase, which is devastating. And, you know, one of the things that I thought was like, is there a way that we can lift people out of poverty using this cultural artifact um, that is widely sold. It, it, you know, Lay's were already widely sold, even before us. You know, Lay's had been appropriated and sold across this country, across the globe, with the understanding, with the common knowledge that it is something that comes from the Pacific Islands, specifically from Hawaii, and it's through Hawaii's colonization um, that, that Lay's are made have been made so popular. Um, so I did want to add that. And in terms of the Lay Company, the, the Lay Company, I tell people that the Lay Company uses a 200-year business plan. So, and why I say that is because, you know, when we were forming the company, I had to go back about 100 years to figure out, like, when did we start being sold. And I dug through the University of Hawaii at Manoa's like oral history archive. And I found these like beautiful like transcripts of native Hawaiian laymakers um, that were done. These interviews were done in the 80s. And in the 80s, they were like 90 years old. So a lot of what we are doing now are things that these women who started, you know, like selling lays as children, like really early. We're talking like 18, like late 1800s, early 1900s. They were first selling them, you know, on ships, um, on the Matson cruise ship that would go from San Francisco to Hawaii. Um, you know, they were saying like, what would have happened if we would have band together and started a business? like, you know, some of the other Asian rainmakers. And so that's like a hundred years back. And where we currently looking is a hundred years into the future. Like we really are trying to be a lay company that is looking at not only cultural preservation, but also cultural evolution of lay, of lay, of laymakers and of laymaking the craft. And so a lot of our business model revolves around, you know, building a business that could provide good jobs, right? So that laymakers and laymaking isn't a side hustle for our people. And if we grow really large for, for lots of other people, not just specific Islander people. And we're also looking at if we're able to look at a hundred years out, that also means that we're looking really, really deep into our supply chain. And lay, the lay supply chain is primarily the uh, cut flower market and really trying to shift, you know, doing our little part 
in terms of shifting that market as well. And so, you know, later on, uh, you know, when we get to talk about like some of our successes, I can talk about, you know, you know, our new farming initiatives and things like that. But how, what is you it know, that we, you're trying to shift towards? I would say that it is complex, right? So if we just focus primarily on the cut flower market, we do want lays to be made with more sustainable products, right? So, so our market is primarily the continental U.S., right? And so, you know, we want we want to be able to provide lays made with more locally grown flowers, you know, not flowers that are grown in Thailand, um, you know, Thailand, Malaysia, and Singapore, where you know, right now we're not at the point where we can totally cut off that market, you know, we can't cut ourselves off from that market because the idea of a lay is this like purple vanda orchid lay. Um, and so we have to have some element of that. And so we we hope to become a more stronger member in what they call the slow flowers movement. Mm-hmm. But that's just one part of the movement, right? Right. right. Really going into our, our agricultural supply chain and growing our own, like, leaves and flowers. So that's one thing. But then also in terms of good jobs, right, (laughs) like being able to provide a job that can turn laymaking into a a profession that can pay a sustainable wage or a regenerative wage that can provide benefits, you know, health care benefits over time, things like that. You know, that's another that's another one of our aims mm-hmm. um, and another one so, of the, the, the tracks that we, we go right. down to try to build to that 100-year business plan. A cooperative business model. I, there, are, there seems to be so few companies that are organized in such a way. Can you share with our listeners what exactly that means and why you decided to form a cooperative? A cooperative. Okay. Let's see. I have to break it down a little bit. Okay. So uh, when I was studying like legal entities, I was trying to find the entity that allowed a group of Pacific Island folks to be able to be ourselves and yet be compliant meaning that decision-making is shared, that there's a lot of collaboration. And the legal entity that I found happened to be a worker-owned cooperative um, or a California cooperative corporation. And California, or just cooperatives in general, are are democratically run uh, businesses. I mean, that's kind of the short definition of a co-op. When I talk about us specifically, I was just trying to find, like, you know, like what legal entity could we be that allowed us to, you know, be who we were, like still do have a lot of like collaboration where we could practice our values of reciprocity, where there was shared decision making. And it just so happened that there was a legal entity that existed and it was a cooperative. Now, the other thing, consideration um, I had as a founder was that we can't own laymaking. You can't own it. It is a cultural asset of the world. And yes, here in the United States, it's most associated with Pacific Islanders, but it's, but flower garlands are a part of ceremony and ritual across the globe, right? So lots of other people, you know, use lay in, in their celebratory and other kind of sacred ceremonies. And you know, we wanted to have a legal entity that could allow us to grow exponentially and be able to provide these business ownership and employment opportunities. And being a California co-op allows us that because it's, you know, not like an LLC where you can only have like a limited number of, of people be a part of it. Like it, it's an unlimited number. So we could grow exponentially and potentially across the globe. Nice. Um, And so that's that's why the co-op model works for us. 
So we've got about a minute left, and I know you wanted to talk about your scholarship, and maybe you can let folks know how they can reach you in about a minute. Okay, great. Okay, so um, one of the things I'm most proud about um, is that, you know, one of the things that actually co-ops are really great at is in terms of shared prosperity. And so yesterday, no, on two, no, on Wednesday, sorry. <laughs> on Wednesday, the Pacific Islander Honor Roll at Oakland Unified School District, they had a, a Pacific Islander Honor Roll ceremony and we were able to give away our very first community scholarship, which we named the Nation Scholarship, um, to a young woman from Skyline High School named Christina Lauti. And that to me, for me, is one of our greatest successes because that, right. that's why we're here. We sell late, we take the profits, and we share it with our community. And um, how might so, folks reach you? We're, yeah, we're kind of out of time, so uh, let's... Yes, we have a website, and it is www.thelaycompany, L-E-I, so the L-E-I company.com. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Tiffany, for being on Heartstock. This is Carol Murphy, your host, and we will see you next week. Peace. No no Heartstock Radio is a production of KBMF 102.5, Butte America Radio. Hear our live programs every Friday at 5 p.m. Mountain Standard Time via live stream at butteamericaradio.org. That's right.